freedom can only come from the oppressed. And it can never be negotiated with the oppressor. You know, black people have been poor for a long time, and a lot of them live to please white people. Because white people have resources. What exactly is black life after liberation? Living side by side with white people to hug and kiss was not what we fought for. Pleasing them was not what we fought for. We've not built a single city for 30 years post-apartheid. In fact, we've messed up the ones we found. <laughs> Spread the fire. Welcome back to SMWX. Today, I'm extremely excited to bring you one of the most popular guests ever on this channel. Someone whose interview the first time I spoke to him helped to blow this channel up. A senior advocate, one of the most profound legal and political thinkers, a political activist, and someone who's made a great contribution to our country, its past and its future. Advocate, Muzis Kakane. Baba, thank you so much for joining us on SMWX again. Thank you. Firstly, before we begin, just to celebrate your contributions to the law, to our country, to activist, uh, activism and to struggle, I think we often celebrate people when they're no longer here and you're one of the living legends of our, of our society. So from our community, thank you for all that you've done and continue to do and, and struggle for in, in our country. Thank you. Your life was threatened oh, yeah. uh, last year. Um, Independent Online, I think, released an article, which people seem to ignore, yeah. that said that your life and the life of one of your clients, Arthur Fraser, was threatened. Was that something that should have been ignored like it was, or was that a serious threat on your life? <laughs> I've had threats into my life since I was 18, so I think it's a serious thing because not necessarily to me. I think it's serious if you look at what it means. Uh, mm. That I, I don't see it as a threat just to me. Mm. I, I see this as a, a mechanism by the powerful to, to tell young lawyers, don't represent people we don't like. It goes against the grain of what an advocate is, which is representing people. So I see it as a, it's a threat, yes, but I see it as part of South African life and the problems that we have in South Africa. You say it was ignored. Actually, it was quite revealing to me mm. because I've been an advocate for 21 years, right? So mm. I know many people. Mm. It was interesting that actually to see the... The fact that I can tell you only five colleagues phoned me about it, hmm. right? And that's, I'm, not, I'm not complaining. It reveals to you that we've reached a point where even those of us who are in the profession, we've reached a point of hatred of people who represent certain people. So if Dalim Pofu collapsed tomorrow, because people hate his clients, they will celebrate. That's what we've reached. And that's the sad part about it. But mm. I think as a threat to one's life, it's inconvenient, but I think it's, it depicts South African difficulties, mm. um, the promise of freedom that's not there, uh, free speech that's not there, mm. um, the ability for people to do what they're supposed to do without threats. And that's what it represented to me. Mm. Um, but of course, no one wants to die. But mm. that's how I see it philosophically. I, I don't see it as something that would make me not go where I want to, do, to be. You know, what you say is so interesting because it seems like for some people, yeah. when they're connected to certain interests of power, I don't know whether that's political power or economic power, we take threats seriously. Uh, so Andre Dureta, Yes. Uh, you know, there was talk of threats on his life and him being poisoned, which is terrible. And there was outcry and uproar and media articles. And, and then I think then there's a threat to the life of an advocate who's representing a controversial political client. 
as advocates do. And there's no outcry, there's no media articles, there's, and what is it gonna take? Is it gonna be, someone must be actually killed before all of this abuse that gets heaped on advocates for representing certain clients, before people realize that this is a very difficult climate to work in when you're brave enough to represent the controversial and the downtrodden and those who are on the wrong side of, of media narratives. Yeah. No, no one walks into my chambers because they are happy, right? So advocates are like a, a mortuary. We actually deal with people who have problems, who have made enemies. The problem with the example you give, for instance, is that it flows from what I call South Africa's dominant ideology, whiteness. Had I been white, first I wouldn't be threatened. But if I am, there would be an outcry. So I'm black, and therefore, if you're black, you're dehumanized. It doesn't matter. This is the life of any person in Katlehong, in Soweto, in Umlaz, in Umtanzani. And it's not just that black life doesn't matter to white people. Even black people are conditioned to see themselves and black life as something not important. That's what I call the ideology of whiteness that runs South Africa and the post-colonial state. It means it's not a color. It's a way of seeing life. It's a way of seeing things. It's a way of being. And white colleagues don't go through that. People who represent a priest who's accused of raping young girls, we don't even know who he is. But we know who represents Zuma on Kwebani, and we are upset. But we are not upset about an advocate who represents a priest who's accused of raping black kids. Because it doesn't matter, because it's black lives. And when you say these things, they say you're playing a race card. It's because saying someone is playing a race card is also a mechanism of confirming whiteness so that you can't speak about it. And so I see it in that way. But this way it flows from, I'm going to suggest something to you politically mm. at, at the end of this interview about this country. It flows from what I think is our failure to theorize the post-colonial state, our post-colonial reality, what it looks like. And it permeates down this, this ideology of white appeasement, of celebrating white power over the life of an African is so dominant mm. that it has, I always say the example, it's like, you know, if you told the fish that it's in water, it wouldn't know what you're talking about. That's what this has become. We, we don't even know that we hate ourselves. Uh, we, we, we don't know that we speak to black people. I said to you recently, last week when I was listening to the ministers about the protest, mm. I could hear P.W. Porter in the president's voice. I could hear Adrian Flock in Taylor's voice. I don't think he's aware. It's because we too have been conditioned to look at black life, black people, and ourselves mm. in an inferior way. And so when people don't mind if you die, it's not about you per se, it's about themselves. It's a reflection of how black people themselves have been conditioned to mm. see black life. And we need to educate our people slowly to get out of this uh, in, the prof in the legal profession. Let me give an example. You know, a lot of people phoned me once. They said I was rude to a white colleague in court. And I wasn't. I'm never rude. But you know, we're not conditioned to see a white man when he's berating me. Black people don't see a white lawyer who's belittling a black person. They only see my response. You know why? It's because we are socialized to see a white person as the only human being entitled to talk down to another. And so even black people say, feel embarrassed when you answer back to a white person because that's, that's not how Dora the domestic work should speak. That's not how John the gardener should speak. And we need to change that entire 
set of social relations where we accept our own inferiority because it permeates into all sorts of uh, things we do for the country and in the country. And, and I think the legal profession, you will see it's the epitome of what I'm talking about because I think it's an offshoot of colonial thought itself. Well, it's interesting that you say that and you, you, you're striking at some personal nerves as well because obviously everyone knows that my father's an advocate representing some fairly controversial clients himself. And yeah. I just don't think people really know the kind of abuse that comes people's way. So I have no problem with people disliking the clients and what they've done, whether that's politically or economically. And I mean, if you're a lawyer, even if, they, if they've committed crime, that's abhorrent if it's proved. But now to turn your hatred and anger to the advocate who's representing them as if he is now identified with the cause of that client, but not stopping there, to then turn to their families. Oh, they do. So, I mean, the amount of abuse I get because my father is represented. So I'm two degrees away from this, but you know, on social media, people will constantly just, if a case is happening, you know, abu emotionally abuse me because of who my father um, is representing. And for a while, you know, within this context and this climate, you start to think, okay, it's just public discourse. And, but then you start to, to realize, wait, how come some people get the abuse? and others don't. And, and what I've started to see, and I'm, I'm sorry to say this, and just building on what you've said is, white advocates don't get the same abuse. You can represent whoever you want. You can represent state capture people. You can represent murderers. You can represent terrible right-wing extremist terrorists. And you're just doing your job. Your children don't get called out. But when it's a black advocate, they become their client. Yeah, you know, it's not personal, but I think that's why I keep saying you must look at it philosophically. You know, it's, a, it's an extension of the theme mm. that black people are inherently and epistemologically inferior. Mm. That because you are black, you are not professional. And because you are black and you represent Zuma, therefore Zuma are manipulates me into his agenda. It has mm. nothing to do with Zuma or Arthur Fraser or any client of Mkwebane. Mm. It has it actually an extension of an attitude toward a black body, a black mind, a black person, that we, I don't think people even think about it. It's because when you tell them these examples that, but I know, I know colleagues who represent white thugs, who represent people who sell black girls for sex, they walk around, they're very happy. They, I can't sit at restaurants, mm. <laughs> but those people can. But it's an extension of what I think we've not resolved in South Africa, mm. is that we created a political settlement whose idea was not to take black people out of misery, to live a free life, but it was an idea to lull them into silence so that white power could continue. There is nothing as good for white power as post-apartheid South Africa. Because you create a, doc a document called the Constitution, which I call a lullaby song, <laughs> to keep black people happy hmm. so that they can live and exist at their own expense because they are black and they've been reduced to people who just want a tap of water, hmm. um, maybe no pothole in the street, but are not on control of the command heights in their own country. So what you see is, is in, in all facets of our life is actually an extension of an anti-black colonial mindset that is very dominant in African society, in South African society, and across races, by the way. And we are unfortunate that the former liberation movement, I think, although it trained me, I grew up in it. I think it's mm. anti-black mm. in outlook and philosophy. I don't think they are aware, but I think in outlook, 
it's anti-black and it has not really re-theorized. Mm. What exactly is black life after liberation? Mm. Should people in Spokane live the way they do for the next hundred years? Because I think they will. Should people in Tanzania and Kiani live the way they are? And if you really think about it, you close your eyes and think about it. Can you see people in Amman's crowd and their children ever living that misery? No. It's because we've not theorized post-apartheid South Africa and what it means to the person who's lived through colonization generation after generation. And the worst form of oppression is, is the one to which you consent because you have no viable options. And that's the character of South Africa's political settlement and the so-called post-apartheid South Africa, which Aubrey correctly calls neo-apartheid state. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's one more thing I want to ask on the profession that stems from what you say. Before we widen, you've already taken us to the constitution and, and the, South Af the idea of South Africa itself, which I want to delve deeply into as well. Yeah. But just on, on the kinds of things you faced, the threats that you faced, the media climate that you faced, the social media abuse that you, the, the, just the, the people identifying you with your clients. What I also think, and this is why I'm, I'm quite passionate about speaking about this okay. these days, because I think we all suffer in silence, those who are linked to you advocates and sure. that you the advocates yourselves, is what are people really calling for? Are they calling for a situation where there are certain people who are unrepresentable? Are they calling for a situation where no one is brave enough to take on the causes of these clients and therefore they are no longer able to be represented or they must be represented by the worst. Um, there's an attempt at intimidating people out of their duties to represent yeah. clients who require legal assistance. And the ultimate aim is to say, just don't go there and and justice is for these people, but these people don't deserve representation. And, and how dangerous is, is, a, is a criminal and a legal justice system when certain people are unrepresentable? Yeah, you know, I've said, if you want to understand law, you must start at its philosophical sense, right? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, 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 it's a way, it's politics. Law is politics. Don't listen to anyone who say there's something, oh no, it's political, no, it's law. Mm -hmm. People who say that are doing that so that the political agenda that wants to be dominant can thrive. So at a philosophical level, law is just politics dominated by a powerful classes. Um, and so the intimidation you talk about, I, I understand it philosophically because what it is, it's, it's a component of a dominant structure, an insidious dominant structure that seeks to intimidate on behalf of a particular dominant class. So when people threaten my life, they, it's not just Muzi, they, some of them have never met me, you know, so it's mm. not personal. Sure, sure. But there's an idea they are threatening, an idea that don't, you know, black people have been poor for a long time and a mm. lot of them live to please white people because white people have resources. And so we sit in Rosebank and Santin and all of these um, false non-racial restaurants um, to, to please white people because they have resources. So when people intimidate someone like me or other advocates, what they're doing is to tap into the anxieties of black people for survival. So it's not just physical. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you now mm -hmm. that uh, when you don't, when the white structure doesn't like you, you can starve. Hmm. And no one wants to starve, you know, unless you are me. <laughs> <laughs> so in a way, if I tell you that in the past four years, apart from government hmm. that took work from me, all the big law firms that used to brief me told 
never briefed me. Hmm. So you have to deal with that. And in order to survive that, you must understand mm. that. And it's not easy because young people who are advocates, they want to pay rent. Absolutely. And, want, and so they, they'll capitulate the, and all of this because no one wants to live in misery. Mm. But, you know, I live by the fact that I think you better starving in dignity than eating in shame where you don't lose yourself. And I think the white system doesn't like that. And that is why our leaders are servants of whiteness. It's because they depend on whiteness to survive, to, to finance their lavish lifestyles. Mm. And so even at the level of advocates and engineers and others, mm. for a young black person who's always lived in misery and poverty, it takes great courage or foolishness to defy white power. And so these intimidation tactics are actually an extension of a broad agenda of white power and classes that are powerful to whip us into line. And you will see this is even in private lives, generally non-racialism is a great thing, but you will achieve it if we are equal. But in these white black relations that you see, you are only a friend if you live the way your white colleague likes. The day you differ with them, no, because you are inferior. You are a childlike being that must be whipped into line. If you don't, you can't be a friend if you have a mind of your own. And I think that's the life of a black person, generally in the township, in the farm, in the rural areas, in professions, at the workplace, in parliament, and everywhere. And it permeates up. And I think the current political system we have and the leadership we have currently I think is the best meal for white power hmm. because in it they have black leaders that white power likes. A subservient, smiling, black person who can tolerate the suffering of others. That's what they are. And that is why that's the tragedy of post-apartheid South Africa in my view, and, and I, I like to always say in the profession, you know, the profession is that, that small corner in a swimming pool, and it can't be dry inside the swimming pool. So we keep analyzing small things there and there, and the real challenge the, in the room, the elephant in the room for South Africa, mm. is a lack of a firmly articulated, post-colonial framework, ideology, in other words, a set of ideas uh, by which we live, by which we view freedom of a black person in particular. Well, some would say that the framework that we have as a society is the constitution. And there have been spirited defenses, despite the inequality and injustice all around us of of the constitution. It's not the constitution's fault. It's, it's the government's fault. It's, it's always someone else's fault. But you've been unique in being quite radical in your critique of the constitution as a legal framework. Do you think that the, con the constitution can be salvaged? Or do you think that the constitution itself is so incapable of taking us to a new place that in fact we need to think beyond the constitution. Let me ask you a question since I know you ask me questions. Sure. Have you ever seen the word apartheid in that constitution? I have searched it very closely and I have not. Have you ever seen the word atrocities in that constitution? No. You know why you haven't seen it? It's because that constitution, with all the other nice things that we have, is a lullaby song to ensure the continued survival of white power. It's a product of a negotiated Orwellian manipulation of the former colonized masses. 
to like what's coming, but to live at their own expense and accept it. That's sure. the, for me, that's the document. Mm. And I keep saying this, mm. watch very closely in South Africa, who praises this constitution? Which NGOs tell us this is the best? Which individuals tell us this is the best? And you go to Mdanzani now and pick up an old lady who has a pit toilet. Tell them they live in a country with the best constitution and you'll see what she'll tell you. Go to an NGO, these white NGOs that pretend they are not political when all they are extensions of white power who say they protect the constitution. They protect it because it's a document they value, because it maintains what they stole, what they have. And so we need to move beyond it. And I'm not saying hmm. we should, well, first of all, I'm saying hmm. we should do away with it. Hmm. We should rewrite it. Wow. Because it's an important document, what I call our post-colonial theory. Yeah. Our post-colonial framework. But this post-colonial framework is truly and fundamentally, if you look at it closely, anti-black and pro-white power. That's... Quite, quite the statement, and uh, it's it's incredible to hear you. I've heard you in other interviews and and your thinking, but it feels like you are now at the point where you have now, you're like, just done with this thing. Uh, I'm and done with it. I think a lot of people will will be shocked, but also will 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 think, okay, this is scary because if we dispense with this blueprint, where to? But I'm quite interested and I'm quite excited by the prospect of what happens when we start thinking beyond the limits that we have set for ourselves over the last 30 years and and start saying how do we get beyond this because this is not working I think everyone can see if if if, yeah, no. if, if this is your idea of, of a society that's that's working then then your idea is broken how do we get beyond that and start creating a blueprint for a new society that yes, maybe takes the gains that, that we have made since 1994, meager as they are, yeah. but transcends them and, and becomes ambitious about actually what we really want to do with the society rather than ameliorating and appeasing all these different interests. You know, since colonialism and later apartheid were, was a, a huge hegemonic enterprise against the peoples of Africa. It was a major turning point in their lives, culturally, economically, politically, and privately. And so if you want to change that, you need to be bold about setting out a framework that is the antithesis of that history. Yeah. And one of the problems we have you know, a lot. Some a comrade of mine once uh, said to me, as they always do, "But this Zuma you represent," and this, and I say to them, "You see, these leaders of the NC are not the cause of the problem. They are the product mm. of a decline, of a failure to theorize what freedom should be for an African." But also they are a product of what we call the political settlement, whose main theory really is white appeasement. And so the day black people stop, when they think about what needs to happen, what would white people say? Because that reflects our inferiority, our inability to trust ourselves. So to come back to your question, mm. The Constitution, okay, I'm, I may suggest something very controversial to you now about this Constitution, but we'll see. Mm. I think it must be rewritten. Mm. And a lot of people call for, let's say, the president must resign, the ANC must not be there, and all of this. Mm. There must be an election. Mm. Since where elections have never produced freedom. What produces freedom is a progressive honest theory of taking 
your people out of misery. So I, I want to propose that actually it's not the president we must get rid of. It's not elections we must have. I actually think the three arms of government must resign now. It means the judiciary, the executive, and the legislature. Now, of course, I'm not asking for disorder. Mm. I'm saying these three arms of government must resign and we write a new constitution. We have a national people's assembly. We can decide the mechanics. Mm. And why must we do this? We must do this because we have two choices. We must tolerate this life that our people live and say there's nothing we can do about it. And if we do that, we actually are on the brink of a civil war at some point, of an Arab Spring, mm. of a leaderless revolution. Sure. I'm calling for a resignation of the three arms of government and we set up right now a forum in which we can theorize the future for our children, mm. which is post-colonial, which is true freedom for a black person, which will take the person who lives in poverty in Folueni or in Tanzania out so that their children can get out. I'm proposing that we do that so that we can ourselves control the theory that we develop and persuade other South Africans, be they black or white, that no one will ever be free until everyone is free. We will live in fear with guns at the corners every time there is a march because we know deep inside our hearts that I am middle class, I live in a suburb, but I will never be free until everyone is free. And so I'm asking that instead of tinkering with this system, mm. I would like the three arms of government to get out now. And I would like the parties that are pro-black to have an assembly. And when I say pro-black, I'm talking about Azapo, the EFF, the PAC, the ATM, the UDM. Those five in particular for me are the only pro-black parties that can re-theorize South Africa's future. They are not the only ones who can run South Africa. I'm saying they need to re-theorize the plight of a black person. And I'm not mentioning the ANC out of vengeance or anything. I'm not mentioning the ANC because I think the ANC is in a state of confusion. They are caught up in this, something I called the, the ideology of non-ideology, right? <laughs> They, they, they're surviving, and I think the ANC has a great history. You know, if it was football, I would say the ANC is like that jersey number 10. It's time to retire jersey number 10 mm. so that we can re-theorize. And I think it's also because the ANC, I've been in the ANC since I was 19 or 18, right? Has never had a sophisticated analysis on race. It's one of its biggest witnesses with all its great achievements, the ANC is probably the weakest organization on theorizing about race. Sure. Because the ANC has an obsession with something it has called non racialism maybe since the 50s. Mm. And when you see that, you see that, I don't think it's unwilling. I don't think it's true that the, the ruling party is unwilling. I think it needs a break to rethink itself, to see whether are they what O.R. Tambo, Chris Hani, and others really envisioned? Mm. Do they leave the historic mission of this organization they joined? I think not. And so I think they need a break to re-theorize uh, who they are, to reflect on who they are, mm. because I think they haven't done that uh, in their daily struggles of surviving and having jobs. Yeah. But I think we need to now, if we, are, we must avert bigger problems for the country, we need to re-theorize the post-colonial state, rewrite the constitution, do away with the three arms of government as we see them, create a people's assembly to look at the future. It can take us six months, it can take us a year, but if we don't do that, we're gonna face violence at some point because people will rise up. Or 
we accept that slavery is a permanent condition for a black person. It's up to us. I don't want to accept those. And so faced with failure of what I'm suggesting, then I would say this is the state of affairs. Or at some point, people must rise up. And you know, poverty is violence. We don't see it because we don't face it. Yeah. Yeah. So when this country can deploy 3,400 soldiers in 12 hours, just a week ago, young children and women in Westbury were looking for protection. They couldn't get it. Mm. So, so the problem is, is just in, in how we, we conceptualize black lives and what must happen. Yeah. And I'm not saying this because we must not have non-racialism. I'm saying this because we can lead this country, every corner of this country, including white people, to understand that they will never be free until every black person is free. Mm. It doesn't matter how many times they bury their heads in the sand and how many of our leaders they co-opt uh, to be part of it. Mm. And I think... I'm not being disorderly for suggesting this. And I think Bantu Olomis, General Olomis, has suggested a Codessa at some point. And I think yeah. it's an idea that I'm talking about, but it's something more, I think we must rewrite this constitution and get rid of the three arms of government um, and see what we put in place. Baba, I think what you've said is very radical in the best sense of the term, in the sense that it's a deep diagnosis of the society, which is just, it's not just about changing one policy here or there. It's not yeah. just about even changing governments, but it's about actually rethinking this whole thing that we even call South Africa and the South African state. And I think what, what that does, of course, you can say, okay, well, how do we do that and what would that look like? But I, that for me isn't the productive conversation. For me, the more productive conversation is if we were to rewrite everything and someone did give us that opportunity and we said, okay, now we've learned what we've learned over the last 30 years, how would we redesign this state and, and this constitution and, and this project? Then that opens up new possibilities for rethinking, redesigning, remaking. Have, have you had any thoughts on the actual practicalities of what could we redesign and what should we redesign if we, if we had this moment of temporary transition, everyone we come together to remake, um, what would we do? I think that's a profound question. We must first answer, it's a basic question. You know, successful societies, whether you like them or not, have a philosophy by which they run their state. Sure. And when you have a philosophy by which you, by the way, all you need to run a country is that philosophy. Other people may not like it. And when you have that firm philosophy, mm. you know that what you need in a country is first to understand your demographics. You also know that you need a, a sovereign state with integrity. Yeah. You also yeah. know that you need security for your people. You also know that you need a health system for them. But most importantly, you need a public education system that's free because ignorance is more expensive. And once you have that philosophy, you know, if we have that philosophy, we wouldn't say, by the way, what do we do with ESCOM? Should we have a minister of uh, electricity or a minister of potholes? The reason we keep doing these things is actually because we don't have a philosophy. Mm. And so what you would do is to truly rethink. And I think, as you said, our leaders in 1994, I'm very skeptical about people who were involved in 1994. They don't like being criticized. Mm. Uh, they think you are calling them sellouts and mm. all of this. But, mm. you know, I think every time we must rethink the mistake and errors we made. I'm not calling people sellouts. They may have been. But I think if you create, a, you first look at the problems in the country. You look yeah. at how 60% or 70% of South Africans live. And you start from there. 
So your theory, your basic theory, if it must be radical and it must be a post-colonial, honest post-colonial theory, is how do I get people who lived in misery for centuries out of it? Not overnight. We don't have that. Mm. Look at our geography. I call it our apartheid geography. What have we done? We've actually built concrete shacks. What have we done to our schools? We've actually condemned the schools to be dead zones of uh, disimagination. There's no education. There's no critical thinking. What have we done to God, our churches? That must be the center of a, a society, their morality and what they do. And when I say God, People think uh, you can't mention God and be intellectual. <laughs> I don't mean after life. I'm talking about the moral heartbeat of a society because we are mm. a morally vacuous society at the moment. So mm. that document would have to be a document that first starts with what was wrong. You know, if you want to mm. free an abused wife in a house and you ask, by the way, how do we solve this? Get the abused woman out of the house. So what's our theory? Get a document. You know, the RDP was an attempt. Get a document, document whose basic aim is that in a, at a particular time, five years, black people must see the difference, not just mm. toilets, not just roads. Yeah, or rights in, in the air. Yeah. Mm. When you have that theory, mm. by the way, Israel, you know whether land must be privately owned, sea space must be privately owned, which I don't believe, airspace must be privately owned, or mines. So if you really want freedom, create a document in which you turn in some way the command heights of the economy, those key levers, your natural resources to benefit development of your people, that's the starting point. The other things, whether people have a, a toilet is a good thing and all of those things. But as I said to you, democracy without justice is hypocrisy. And when you have justice without economic empowerment of the people you are trying to free, you're deepening their crisis. And so I'm suggesting that that People's Assembly will also give some ideological guidance to the three arms of government that, that I call deeply colonial in the way they think. Um, and I can't even tell you whether it's the judiciary that is wrong or it's the executive. It's everything mm. because mm. it does not have a foundation. Yeah. It doesn't have a, a road map because our road map is how best we can please white power and how best we can please those who control the economy when actually it should be how best can we t take over what belongs to the people how can we make sure that people have a state bank that mines that have resources of our people where they were born are used for their developments, for free education? How can we make sure, Sizwe, that Africa gets out of underdevelopment? You buy coffee now, made in Kenya, but you buy it from America or Europe. You buy gold refined, it comes from here but you buy it from a foreign country. It's because we are not in control of what God gave us here, which is natural resources, and the ability to use those to take our people out of misery. And you know why we can't do it? It's because for 500 years or thereabout, we were kicked and donored, maimed, raped, and killed for white power to succeed. And we are scared of it. Even if we don't admit it, black people are scared of white power. 
Our leaders broaden their smiles when they talk to white people and shout at our people when they talk to them. Listen to them tomorrow or today. See a minister addressing black people. You will see in that minister his own inferiority complex and how they deal with our people. So it's our fear of years of violence against us. And one of the things we are facing, by the way, is this. I don't believe that you can ever overthrow a system entrenched through violence for centuries non-violently. But anyway, because I'm not a violent person for now, I think we've got to do something radical to avoid that situation. And, and if our leaders did this, they would lead us black and white. You don't have to appease white people to lead them. You have to educate them to understand that their superiority is a fallacy. That the things they stole from us and want to keep are a recipe for disaster, are a recipe for their death in the future. And it's only when they work with us to share what our country has so that our, edu our, our, our children can have free education, so that our country can prosper, so that our people who live in misery, unemployed, can live together side by side. We didn't struggle for non-racialism, Sizu. Non-racialism is a product that comes out of an economically just society. It's a byproduct of economic justice, non-racialism. Living side by side with white people to hug and kiss was not what we fought for. Pleasing them was not what we fought for. But that is a byproduct. Society lives peacefully because you've created conditions of economic justice. And when they see each other as equals, they live peacefully side by side. And that requires firm, honest, courage, leadership. And we don't have it at the moment. And that's what I'm asking is these black parties that I've talked to you about, at some point, every other person, of course, Azapo, the PAC, the EFF, the ATM, and the UDM, maybe a couple of others I may not have forgotten, need to sit and re-theorize the plight of a black person. And if we don't do it, we're staring the spring, Arab spring, in the face. We're staring a catastrophe in the face, and it will be leaderless. And from that revolution, which is leaderless, it will take us decades and decades to get our country back. We need to respect ourselves. We've not built a single city for 30 years post-apartheid. In fact, we've messed up the ones we found. Why? It's because we don't respect ourselves. We think filth and dirt is something we deserve. We think, we think a, a clean city is a bourgeois indulgence. No, it isn't. Our parents were poor, but they were clean. And we need to love ourselves, create lovely conditions for our people. But we can't do that because our outlook, our philosophy is inherently anti-black. And that's what needs to be reversed. Can I put a few things to you as we develop on this idea just to build on it? And yeah. I think ultimately, I'm sure down in the comments of this video on YouTube, also put your ideas and, and thoughts because I think this is the conversation we have to be having as South Africans now. Where to from here and how, how? Yeah. Where to and how to? So what other institutions because I agree with you that this needs a political, it needs political impetus. Yeah. Um, is it the existing institutions or are there new ones political that maybe need to be built alongside that um, would be my one thought because I'm not necessarily convinced of the ability of those forces to coalesce and actually drive this. Um, it would need something, in my view, of a, a whole society approach. So, of course, you would have formations that agree, but we would need intellectual leadership from outside, civil society, 
private institutions as well. So I think it's also what I'm grappling with is, is building, not that I can build it, but at least talking about how we can build yeah. a coalition of forces that would be powerful enough, capable enough, and also wise enough to actually usher a new era in society. Well, yeah. there are institutions, you know, <laughs> Lenin says this mm. in um, a paper he writes to the youth, that when you, you hit a revolution and you're changing, of course, you, there are institutions that you will keep because you will always need. Sure. But, you know, I think it's very, I've seen it in my profession and I've given up actually. <laughs> It's very difficult to transform institutions that were built as anchors mm. of a racist way of life. So, so this discussion we are having, the worst critics you are going to get against me or threatening me are black. Because exactly what I'm telling you, that we have a bigger problem. You know, you can't be free as a society until individuals are free mentally, until black people love themselves. And so in a way, you need those parties that can coalesce around that idea. They may not agree. They may not all be communists, socialists, or whatever. Mm. But you know, we need people who can coalesce around the idea that black life needs uplifting now. Mm. And if you do that, you keep those institutions. So before I scare people, when I say these three arms of government must resign, I'm not suggesting that you leave a vacuum. Sure, sure. I'm actually suggesting that you create an, an, an assembly, a people's assembly that will make sure, we have a lot of eminent people, mm. to make sure that while you do this, yeah. your administration, your courts and other places, as temporary as they may be, because there, there may be no political structure, mm. While you're recreating it, you keep those institutions that must keep the country running. Sure, sure. Um, and the institutions you really need to look at are right at the top. That's why I targeted the three arms. Mm, mm. Uh, because I think we are led at the top of these three arms. I'm not talking about individuals, yeah. philosophically. Sure. We're led <laughs> by the types of black people that white power always likes. Hmm. At the executive level, we, I think we must create structures that are not controlled by the old order. I don't think in South Africa, for instance, we have an independent post-apartheid intelligence services. I think old apartheid intelligence operators operatives are at play big time. And I think most of them handled people who are our leaders. And that's why sometimes you cannot see the difference between an Af sure. our leader and apartheid leader. It's because over time, the slippers in the ANC, what Aubrey calls the policy Ascaris, the slippers in the ANC have grown, have mm. become emboldened and most of them are leading. And that is why you cannot see the difference between some of our leaders and apartheid. It's because these are children of apartheid. These are people trained by apartheid intelligence operatives. Mm. These are people who work for those institutions. And all for what? It's all to maintain the status quo for the world, uh, which is anti-black. And I think we need to create those structures that are new at intelligence level, at the executive level, at the level of the legislature, lawmaking, and I think the courts, for me, it's very difficult to say this because in South Africa, we, we don't like to criticize leaders. Even in the judiciary, see, so when you don't see me do matters anymore that are political, it's because mm. I've basically mm. given up, not on individual charges. Mm. I've given up on their ideological framework as human beings, this institution, because I think it's entrenched unconsciously, I think, in the colonial mindset that is anti-black. Mm. 
And if you told them, they would say no. There's, I think Minister Lindy Wessisulu tried it and there was an outcry. But I think she was saying something similar to what I'm saying, which is at the level of those structures at the top, including the president, by the way, I think we are led by people. Your typical black person that white power likes, a smiling, peaceful, white person, I mean, black leader who wants to keep the status quo, what it is for white people to be comfortable at the expense of his people. And we need to get rid of that thinking in the judiciary, in the executive, and the legislature. And if we do that, just those structures, there's a future for these people who are sitting here, who are young, that one day they can become what white kids become. They'll have a future. Um, at the moment, you ask young people who are sitting here with us, they can't think beyond just being employed. You know why? Because they are conditioned to think so. They are not conditioned to be employers. Right here, it's our education system. And lastly, I'm saying all of this because as uh, Paul Freire says this in his book called uh, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed, freedom can only come from the oppressed. and It can never be negotiated with the oppressor. And that's the basis of what I'm suggesting, and it's constructive, and I would like the country to think seriously about it. I'm not being disorderly, I'm not being disrespectful to judges, to the president and others, but I don't trust them. I don't trust that they have an ideology that is pro-black. It may not be conscious, but I think they need to reflect so that we can move forward. Absolutely, and, and I, you know, I, I commend you for speaking in the best traditions of free speech, which you know, is often co-opted by conservative interests. This is free speech. This is speaking out against the powerful. This is saying subversive things that shock us into realizing how, how terrible our status quo is. And I thank you for that. And I think this is the kind of conversation that I find is missing in mainstream media. And I think it's partly why people are starting to flock to this platform as well. We're getting more views than many mainstream platforms is that people are too scared to say this kind of thing and if they are, they're not going to say it on mainstream platforms. But everyone is thinking it. That I can... It's, I can because, it's because speaking like this has repercussions. Mm. You know, I'm, mm. Not, mm. I'm not blind to those. Sure, you know? sure. So when people fear speaking, yeah. it's because, you know, it has repercussions. Yeah. It has repercussions for you. Mm. It has repercussions mm. for me. <laughs> By the time you fly this, this has repercussions for me. Mm. It has repercussions for everybody. But, you mm. know... Mm. South Africa is probably one of the most intolerant countries about views. So true. So you know, true. I, I did not think that we would be like this after mm. apartheid. And the worst thing is we think we're the most tolerant. No, we yeah. actually, I think there are few countries I know mm. that are so intolerant of a dissenting mm. view. Mm. And it's because speaking your mind has consequences, yeah. bad consequences. Also because, you know, when you don't have economic power, you want to speak in such a way that those who have economic power must love you. But I think if you look at history, you will see that uh, the people who spoke, who fought, did this fully aware of the repercussions. You know, I don't think Steve Bigo went into that van not knowing that he was not coming out. But it's, it's what we do about it. It's if a few of us can speak, maybe to our detriment, professionally and personally, it starts the debate. You know, it starts, I, I'm not unaware, sis, with that uh, probably for this suggestion. Um, I'm sure at the state security services as we speak, um, they are, they'll be working tonight to see how you and me can be uh, found and then probably intimidated or exposed for some tea bags we stole when we were young. Oh my. Because that's what we do, because we have no ideology. We don't have a security system that looks 
at the future that advises on policy. We mm. have a security system that is apartheid trained. You know, so in a way, we need to start these debates and be brave enough. I'm not saying these things because I have the intellect or anything or that I can lead anybody. No, I'm suggesting that my country must do this. Mm. You know, mm. um, and I may be wrong, and I think that's fine. It's just my view. Sure. And I think what we're, what we're all yearning for is that real debate, you know, because it feels like we have an artificial debate right now where you have to agree with certain assumptions before you can enter the debate. And actually, the status quo is so abhorrent that yeah. we have to start challenging the assumptions. And that's where we'll find the true debate. Yeah. And, and out of that debate... Something, something beautiful can be born. But if we're not even ready to have these debates or we just silence people or shame them for raising these concerns, then... I challenge anyone, Sizwe, all of you here and everywhere and all of those who are upset that I express the view, go to where black people live. Just watch them. Go to our schools. Go to Eddington Hospital yeah. in KZN yeah. or Barra. Mm. Tell me that when you watch that, yeah. you can see black people in the next hundred years mm. out of that if we continue this way. Absolutely. You know, and, and, and as I say, I'm challenging people to go watch this because I think in South Africa we have our debates in such binary terms mm. that uh, we, it's this faction or that faction. You know, I, I don't know these factions. Yeah. What yeah. I know is that black people lived here a foreigner came, stole their land, subjugated them, put them in camps, took their minds, took their wealth, took their culture, took their life, took their souls, and kept them like that, and co-opted their leaders to assist them, to keep them in bondage. And that's what I'm saying we must change. Well, Advocates Kakane, thank you for... I think one of the best episodes of SMWX ever and that we might ever have. Uh, thank you for sharing such brave thoughts with us and for seeing this platform as a place to, to share those thoughts. And uh, we really appreciate your, your being part of this platform. I hope your platform won't be banned. That's the aim. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Aye, aye. <laughs>